Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Lars. Thanks you to everybody for being here uh, this afternoon. And I would uh, double up on all the thank yous that Lars has already provided. Um, uh, this is a very exciting evening for us, and it's a very exciting evening for us in particular because of all the VIPs, uh, and all of you are VIPs that, that, are, that are here. That are here. Um, I, in particularly, Adam Smith Institute, who we've had a relationship with really for years now and have really helped promote the ideas of Ayn Rand in, in the UK, really, I think our first, uh, uh, our first engagement with another think tank was with the Adam Smith Institute, I don't even remember how many years ago. Um, but this evening is really a, a culmination of something that started, and again, I don't remember how many years it was, but, but 12 years ago, uh, a dinner in London uh, with Lars. Uh, Lars had just uh, ordered uh, 10,000 copies uh, of, of Atlas Shrugged uh, with the Saxo logo on it and a introduction uh, written by, um, written at Saxo, by, you know, for the bank, uh, for the bank customers and blank clients. And uh, I was curious who these people were uh, who, who were so passionate about Atlas Shrugged that they would want to distribute it all over Europe. Uh, and, uh, and we landed up meeting, uh, uh, scheduling a dinner and meeting in London. And since then, uh, I've returned to uh, the Saxo Bank many times, uh, not always in this beautiful building. I remember other headquarters uh, of the past. Uh, and it's always, uh, it, it's always been with open arms that I've been received here, and it's, uh, it's always been fabulous. Uh, so again, thank you, Kim, uh, and thank you, Lars, for for making Sa Saxo Banks so hospitable to the ideas of Ayn Rand, and really a beacon, I think, out there in Europe. People know, people know, uh, people who work in all kinds of places uh, throughout Europe, some of them have gotten Atlas Shrugged in the mail uh, from Saxo Bank, and, and others have just heard about the influence these ideas uh, have had at Saxo. It's also incredibly rewarding for somebody like me, who's, who's be, really been a devotee, if you will, of Ayn Rand's ideas, really from age 16 on, and, and I've studied it at, at, at a variety of different levels over the, over the many years, um, to see it applied in a business, for business people to take it seriously enough, to, to have it on the walls, as Laws described, you can walk around the offices here and see the, the, the Ayn Rand's virtues uh, illustrated on the wall, uh, and for, the, for, for CEOs to be taking these ideas so seriously and apply them in their business. We have other examples of this in the United States. We have other business leaders here who might be applying it in the same way. And every time I meet somebody like that, it is really thrilling because not only do I believe strongly that these ideas can have a profound impact on one's own personal life, a profound impact on one's relationships with other people, they can have a profound impact on the success of a business, and uh, it, it's, it's terrific to be able to celebrate the success that Saxo has had over the last, uh, over the last decade and a half that I've, uh, that I've known of it. So Ayn Rand Institute is, uh, Ayn Rand Institute is coming to Europe. Why? Um, there's plenty of work to do in the United States, so... <laughs> You know, many of my American contributors and American supporters say, what are you doing? <laughs> and I think it's because of a number of things. One is, interest seems to be increasing. We see it in uh, royalty statements where we see book sales outside of the United States slowly increasing, particularly since 2007, um, of both the fiction and the nonfiction, which is interesting. We see many more invitations, many more, uh, much more interest, particularly among students, and I'm really happy that there are representatives here of, of, of uh, uh, SFL, uh, you know, the ESFL, European Students for Liberty. Um, we're seeing among students, among university students, more and more interest in these ideas, more and more interest in being exposed to them. So we seem to be sending people here without an official presence, so there seems to be uh, an interest. And then, over the years, we've developed some relationships with, with think tanks, Adam Smith Institute, the, the uh, I can't pronounce it in French, I'm sorry, the Liberal Institute in Switzerland, um, and, and others, and there seems to be genuine support 
for Ayn Rand's ideas and, and, and for what the Institute in the United States is doing and what we can bring uh, to, uh, to Europe. Now, granted, the interest in Ayn Rand is not uniform. Certain parts of Europe are, are significantly more interested in these ideas than others, uh, which is interesting and to be studied. Um, but it seems like Eastern Europe, maybe because of their not so distant experiences, um, I, there's a lot of interest. It certainly seems like Northern Europe uh, there's interest, including Scandinavia and, of course, the UK. Um, we're still waiting on you Germans and on you French, but, um, and, and Switzerland, of course, right in the middle there. But, um, so given all the interest, given the book sales, and, uh, and given that, uh, that Laws has really been you know, supporting and promoting this idea, we decided to formalize it, to formalize the relationship. As many of you know, I've been coming to Europe for many years, giving many talks, and uh, that has given me a sense that there is a demand for these ideas. And we want to now formalize that relationship, formalize our commitment to the continent, formalize our commitment to what's going on in Europe. Uh, as as, uh, as Lars said, things are, things are bad and things are dire and, and things are kind of slipping away. Uh, they're slipping away everywhere, uh, which, which is interesting. And that brings me kind of to the second reason to come to Europe, and it, really to go everywhere. Um, we don't know if, things, if, if we're going to be able to change the United States. We don't know if we're going to be able to uh, uh, make a, a substantial difference in the United States before things kind of slip away. We're certainly trying, as are many, many people. We don't know where the next great laissez-faire revolution is going to happen. We don't know where the next great mind is going to be that exposed to these ideas will, be, will become a champion for them and help change the world. After all, we're in the business of trying to change the world. Um, and we want to diversify a little bit, see what else is out there, see who else is interested in these ideas, expose millions, billions of people to Ayn Rand all over the world and see what kind of response, kind of uh, reaction we get. I also believe strongly that any liberty movement needs Ayn Rand. Now, I believe that Ayn Rand's ideas are true, which is a difference between me and Eamon, uh, and therefore necessary for the philosophical foundation of a free society and for the philosophical foundation of a happy, successful life as an individual. So I believe that Europe needs the Ayn Rand Institute. The liberal movement needs the Ayn Rand Institute or needs Ayn Rand. Maybe you don't need us in particular, but you need her. Ayn Rand does provide a philosophical foundation for the ideas of freedom. And as I look around the world, and as many of you know, I travel a lot, and I see a lot of places, and actually, uh, Eamon and I were just in, uh, in South America, and South America, is, it's, 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 it's a little scary to see what's going on in South America in this sense. There are countries in South America that did pretty well. They, they took lessons uh, in economics, and they instituted the right policies, think Chile, and they've done very, very well over the last few years. And they elect socialists who promise to undo all the things that they did well. And there are the countries that were looking at the world to evaluate which economic, political, social system to adopt, choose Venezuela. I mean, I don't know if you guys know what's going on in Venezuela, but people don't have food, they don't have toilet paper, they don't have soap. They leave Venezuela and come back with suitcases full of soap and toilet paper. That's how well they come, but this is what people want to emulate. So, my view is that we have all these, you know, lessons of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we have examples of relatively free countries that are incredibly successful and unfree countries that are disasters, that have failed thoroughly. And yet people don't seem to learn from that experience. So, something's missing. My view is that people's view the world 
not through economic eyes, not even through political eyes, but through moral and philosophical eyes. And that's where the real battle for the soul of civilization is. That's where the real battle for the future of liberty is going to be. It's going to be a philosophical battle. And I think Ayn Rand brings some big guns to that battle. Some big truths, some big ideas, some things that can really change people's minds. And if we win the philosophical battle, if we win the moral battle, then we will have liberty. Because the kind of people Ayn Rand describes as moral, with self-esteem, who believe in their own rational self-interest, do not want to live in a world where they're told what to do and what not to do, what to eat and what not to eat, what to drink, not to drink. They want to live free. They want to pursue their happiness, to pursue the values that they believe will lead to their happiness. They want to exercise their mind in an environment that is free. So to achieve freedom, we need those ideas. We need to challenge conventional morality. And yes, Ayn Rand destroys or, or, or ridicules conventional morality, as she should, in my view. She challenges it, and she presents an alternative, an alternative that I believe leads to freedom, to happiness, to success. So it's these ideas, these philosophical ideas, that we want to expand our reach, we want to bring to Europe, we want to bring to, to, to the rest of the world with, with uh, Europe being uh, uh, you know, our next real big step. Now, how are we going to do this? Because that's a big challenge, and, and uh, there are not a lot of us objectivists, committed objectivists in the world, not a lot of us who can, who can fight this battle. Well, we want to align ourselves with groups that are friendly towards us, we want to uh, we want to find those groups and work with them to bring Ayn Rand's ideas to larger and larger audiences. Uh, I was traveling through Europe uh, this last week, and uh, you know I, I I think I hit uh, eight talks in six countries, uh, with over 800 people uh, attended them. Uh, in the last few months, we've had two other uh, intellectuals from the Ayn Rand Institute visit Europe, uh, Anka Gatte and Greg Solomieri, uh, who spoke in front of a student audience in the UK at uh, Liberty League and in Berlin uh, for European Students for Liberty. And I think they too spoke to significant audiences and young audiences, student audiences, the kind of audiences we really love. We love young people. I have a theory about, with the exception of Lars and a few other people here, so I apologize to all you guys, uh, most people shape the fundamental philosophical ideas when they're young, between age 16 and 30. After age 30, we get busy. Life happens, right? We have family and career and work. And it's, it's very hard to engage in deep philosophical thought at that point, and almost nobody does. Almost nobody does. So if you want to change the world, you have to change young people. You have to get in front of students. So a big push of ours in Europe is going to be to get in front of you, to get in front of students, uh, to get in front of students in universities, to get in front of students uh, when possible in high schools, to get these students engaged with these ideas and to get them reading the books. And of course, this brings us to the major uh, uh, project, if you will, for the for Ayn Rand Europe is going to be to get the books into the hands of people who will read them. And that means translation as much as I'd love if everybody read English, uh, that just is not the reality. So we need to get the books into a variety of different languages. And the beautiful thing here is that Atlas Shrugged, at least, is in most language, European languages already. And, uh, you know, the, the, I think the, the real breakthrough we had there was that finally, after many, many years, um, for the first time ever, uh, there's a French edition of Alice Shrugged. You know, the world's changing. If France is willing. You know. It took an American entrepreneur, by the way, um, who spent a lot of money and his own efforts in order to get it translated, but still the French have a copy, have a version. So, uh, you know, we can be very optimistic now. But in many languages, and you have a, a few there, but there are many more, uh, these books have been translated. Alice Shrugged has been translated. We're very interested in seeing the nonfiction translated. 
uh, Ayn Rand's uh, philosophical works translated. So we would like to see the entire library, the entire Ayn Rand library in a variety of different languages all across Europe. And I think we will be working with a lot of you and with others to make that happen. We also, uh, today I think, launched uh, Ayn Rand Institute uh, Europe websites in four different languages. You know, I'm, am I gonna get these right? German, French, Danish obviously, and, and Spanish. So we now have basically with the same design and the same look and feel as our uh, English uh, website, we now have uh, four. Our plan is within a couple of years to have uh, these websites in 12 to 15 languages. So if your language was not, we don't have it yet, it's, it's coming. Uh, and again, we're looking for volunteers, we're looking for people to help us uh, achieve that. So what we're trying to do with Ayn Rand Europe is to bring Ayn Rand's ideas into the debate. We're try we believe those ideas are true, and therefore if they're in the debate, they will win out. But you can't win if you're not being discussed. You can't win if people don't know who you are. To get them into debate, we gotta get people to read Ayn Rand. And that's mission number one. To get people to read Ayn Rand, they have to be in the languages. We're getting there. To get people to read the books, we have to be engaged in the conversation. We're gonna send people to Europe and they're gonna engage in conversation as we've been for the last few years. We'll only be doing more of that, not less. We're gonna particularly engage, as I said, with young people. So, as Annie and Laws have said, we're looking for people to help. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to translate. We're looking for your connections into student groups. We're looking for opportunities to speak in front of large groups of students or groups of businessmen. We're looking to mimic what has been so successful here at Saxo, to take the principles of objectivism and apply them to other businesses and where there are opportunities to educate those business leaders in these ideas, we're available to help. We're looking for financial support from those of you who are interested and are able to do so. And if you are, please speak to, uh, speak to Annie. So again, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm excited about the potential for what we can achieve in Europe. I think it's essential, I mean Europe whether we Americans like it or not, and it's mostly or not, Europe is the intellectual capital of the world. This is where most of the ideas that we debate come from. This is where most of the ideas in history have been challenged and engaged with. We, need to, we want to be part of that debate. We want to be part of that discussion. Uh, we want to be part of Europe, and uh, we're here. Thank you all for welcoming us. Thank you.